ready when you are. with uh, ELR, um, building an ELR and setting up an uh, extreme long range rifle setup. Um, today I want to touch on some tips to go with loading. It's not going to be a full loading video but some tips on what we do to try and help people with their, with their loading for this sort of precision rifle shooting. Um, basically we use a lot of RCBS gear so the, the rock crusher gear is what we tend to use so from the charge master to a lot of the dies to our loading press is what we use. Um, if you, you can look on it a fair bit through YouTube, I won't go through it, but you can take these things and with a straw inside them and the right tweaks and buttons and things, you can refine them to where they work properly. Um, beyond that type of thing, calibration, calibrating it, make sure it's staying accurate. Um, and I suppose the one tip I could say that in, in the early days of using it, I would rush it a little bit to actually make sure when this thing's run its load, it's gone beep, it tells you what number it's actually just loaded, wait until it comes back to, it's in the instructions, hey use it, but I'll reiterate it, wait until it's come back to retell you the load after that, what you've actually got in there, because at that point is when it'll tell you whether it's accurate or not. Now, at that point you adjust it, make sure the scale's reading properly, but at that point whether you're taking two grains out or you're putting more back in, make sure that it's saying exactly what it's supposed to there. And with a bit of becoming familiar with watching it and making sure it's doing the right thing, you get these things to work very, very accurately. But that is an important part of this, of actually doing them, is making sure that that is as consistent as it can be. I use a single stage press, once again in the, in the Rock Crusher press. Rock Crusher press. The one thing I would say um, that I use, uh, I use the same sort of gear, um, as for full length sizing and neck sizing, I'll go through a little bit more later on, but what I do use um, is these Foster straight line dies. Uh, they essentially are a pretty nice system um, in the fact that they have a spring loaded side of things, which means that they actually make sure they retain the bullet in a dead straight position. Then as you bring it down, it, it starts to seat the bullet once it's actually pushed down a little bit to make sure that bullet is not starting in a crooked form, to make sure it's starting dead straight to start off with. But essentially, that's one of the features I found as a nice thing. Um, I did mention about the neck sizing and full sizing. It really is, uh, my honest call is there's no real recipe for it. It is very much as your gun requires and as your your chamber, your what rate, what level you're running things at, what you're actually doing. I have some, um, like my Shytac, or like the, the 375 Gibbs, uh, the 338, I tend to want to full length size them. Um, it really comes down to, and then it's then there's a range of things, the 223 that we shoot, we don't full length size at all, because essentially we fire form the unit out to where it's actually at the chamber size, and in that strong little, it's in a Seiko um, 85, it's a nice strong sturdy little action, it's only a little round and we fire form it out which lets us run a little bit more powder, makes it easier. They only ever get neck size, I never full, full length resize them. With the likes of the 375 Gibbs or the 375 Shytac Improved, I tried doing that for a while, it sort of worked, but really running that sort of charge, I found that full length sizing was a smarter way to go. Um, with uh, 338, I found that essentially I could run a bit of a combination. I could really run them just at an X size and then full length size because I wasn't changing them very much. I was just bumping shoulders back and, and going uh, basically a full length size every three or four firings. But it changes and I won't say there's any complete consistency to go with that. Um, as for accuracy of it, it's I didn't find any real differences in that score. Um, what I would say, and I suppose I'll touch on that now, is powder charges and essentially the amount of powder, in the truth of it, the way I do my loading, I don't find any difference in accuracy. Now the logic to go with that is that essentially the powder charge and, and the logic of a different powder charge changing your accuracy of your gun is talking about harmonics. And to some degree that's true. 
there is a big degree that people are not taking into consideration is that is not just the harmonics of the barrel but how the whole rifle actually performs so both shooter how the stock is how the bedding is how the shooter is how the shooting platform is how all sorts of other things are greatly contributing to that difference in the amount of powder charge causing a problem the other side of things I would say in most cases the latter test that most people do they essentially I do a large range of powders come to the best one out of that then a smaller range of powders and come to the best one out of that and a smaller one and okay they've got the perfect load for it almost every time if you took that same perfect load and then put it in a different condition whether it's a different shooting position whether it's a different time of year whether it's a um, uh, basically uh, with a small change to the gun that can change things to where all of a sudden that isn't the perfect load the truth of it is as I've said it a few times previously I don't do it that way I don't ladder test at all I run a load to the to a safe maximum pressure so I'm up where I want it to be where it's performing properly I have no over pressure signs and then I make the gun shoot whatever that requires so that's talking about muzzle jump, that's talking about how the gun's actually behaving, that's talking about what it looks like, what it feels like, how much it actually moves from the crosshairs, from the target when I shoot it. And me, the shooter, is just as important as the whole rifle. But I, make, I do my job and I make the rifle shoot with that powder charge. I don't want to come down in powder to lose speed, not that it's everything, but I don't want to come down in powder and change things around because to try and work with a harmonic I want that powder load to work with me so different but and I'm not going to say it works for everyone this is all my tips of what I do not my suggestions this is what I do but it works for me um, I've, I've basically put up here which is the, the primer um, and what we're actually looking at is one of the signs on pressure signs and what we're actually looking at for pressure signs this one the other way around is actually the primer this is actually the back of the case um, I will show up we've got to this drawing up here you'll see what we're talking about um, we have the back of the case which is and then it has the firing hole so you have the primer pocket and the firing hole back over to this drawing it's the other way around but you can see the primer pocket the firing hole and this is the primer and as you see that's a pretty typical curve for a unfired primer and you'll see a similar curve on these corners on a very low pressure if you fire your gun at very low pressure you'll have your firing pin dent in the back of it but you'll have very large round corners. You go to this next one here and looking close this is really what I'm talking about. It's the other way around so this is this is the inside of the chamber that's the firing pocket this is the primer that's the outside of the bullet. You can see these corners are still there but they're almost square so there's still a roundness to them they're not square they're not pushed out they're not ballooned they're not sharp edged but they're at where there's just a corner left in there. That's what I'm normally trying to aim for. Over here, the next one, it's just gone square. And you'll see that in an overpressure situation where those primers are completely flattened out and there's a square edge where there's essentially a sharp edge in a case where you have a slight chamfer on the outside of your primer pocket, they'll actually be ballooned out into that spot. Um, and that's one of the signs of getting it over pressure. The other signs that we're actually talking about is I use the bolt as a very important thing. A few details to go with a bolt and maintenance of a rifle and that side of things which I'll go through in a later cleaning video. But essentially if you have got any tension on your bolt where it's actually getting hard to lift, you're getting it into overpressure situation. Now some rifles are different to others, some how you set up your brass, you know how full it is, what it's running to and all the rest of it, but the truth of it is if you can load that easily and you've got to bump that bolt to get it off or you've got to yank on it, you've got to pull it out or, or when you get it up you can't pull the bolt back out of the chamber because essentially the brass is jamming inside there these are signs of running over pressure in my opinion you may actually be just running high pressures, probably very high pressures but you may still be running safe pressures at that point my way of looking at it is I want to stay away from that I want the bolt to lift properly um, doesn't always, if it doesn't I've got to adjust things but I want the bolt to lift properly naturally come out and I want to see slight round corners on the primer I also don't want to see too much of an imprint on the bolt on the back of the brass these are the main clues that I'm looking at to make sure that I'm staying in my pressure zones 
The other thing is, if I'm doing all that test and I get it all really, really close on a freezing cold day with freezing cold ammo, or for us, Australian freezing cold, freezing cold, so down in the below 50 degrees for us is cold, down there, then essentially that is not a true test of what the powder is. It's safe there, but if I then start shooting in a 35 degree day, a 95 degree day in, in Fahrenheit, um, then I can find that same thing starts to give me overpressure. I try and run a load that is good in all conditions. So I essentially am setting up a load that is at safe max pressure, shooting in essentially a, yeah, a 90 to 95 degree Fahrenheit day. One of the things I found as, as a, a very nice feature, which I found very early on, this is a Sinclair product, I'm sure lots of places do it, but this is a VLD um, case chamfering tool. So it's just essentially got this um, die grind bit, well it's essentially a proper tool with this, a carbide piece for actually chamfering the, 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 um, the shells, and you essentially use it in here, you rotate it in here. Um, what I do it for, this is one of the last procedures. Once you've sized and you've chamfed it, even if you've just fired and you didn't need to actually re-trim your, um, your brass, um, I'll, and I'll go through and I'll tumble the brass. I use a stainless steel media and a wet tumbling is what I'll tend to do in the way of when I am cleaning the brass. This is just a, a new piece of brass. But essentially, even if I'm doing nothing other than a, than a size on the chamber, on the actual neck, I will still go through the inside here and turn that until it's no longer feels like it's sharp. Now, I'm not talking a lot of pressure. I'm not trying to put a big chamfer on the inside of that. You can just feel when it's cutting that sharp edge off to where it's normally really a couple of rotations, fairly light rotations, and you feel it goes from that sharp edge to you can feel it's more pushing over a little chamfer and smooths out in your hands. That's what I do. Now, the logic for that is essentially when you take a bullet, this is a 300 grain burger. Um, this angle down the bottom here is designed so that essentially it feeds in this bullet nicely down the bottom. So rather than have a sharp edge of a sharp chamfer, um, this chamfer is, well they're not identical in its angle, it's really designed to where it lets this go smoothly across the chamfer. Designed to it's got a nice lead to be able to let this in. And I found that's a nice feature. And probably one of the true keys to all my loading is essentially the neck tension and how consistent that is. Now the, there's there's two sides to that. One is um, I want the, the consistency side of things obviously helps with pressure. Very important with pressure. People have mentioned the likes of um, crimping to uh, basically create a, a more even um, or more consistent tension, neck tension and yes it does in a, in a fairly crude form um, and I understand the use of it in military purposes, in semi-automatics, in, in, and I would really more consider it in short-range stuff, but of course it'll do everything. Um, but the truth of it is, what I'm after in the perfect neck tension, you're not using something that's over-tensioning things to even everything out, um, do up everything tight, and it's all going to be even. I'm doing it the opposite way. I want to actually make it as, as gentle as I can to load within reason. So I want it very smooth. There's, there's two things I'm trying to create out of that. One is essentially these bullets of all forms, they're designed specifically like this, specifically like this shape. Every detail about them has been thoroughly worked out to fly through the air as well as possible. This is actually machine bullets, so probably even a little more so than the normal, the standard style burger bullet. But all of them have been thoroughly worked out. So my way of looking at it is any, any damage I do to the outside of the bullet is a negative to that bullet. So if I'm putting much tension, you know, without the VLD, you'll see, you'll see that you'll actually find little scores on the outside of it. You can even with it if you've got higher tensions or it's not going in smoothly. Um, and essentially the one of the tests that I do to check my stuff is that I'll actually pull a bullet back out that I've loaded in the process loaded and pull it back out and I essentially want to see no evidence that it was loaded. There's another feature, more relevant to a, to a machine bullet, but where the actual seating die pushes down on the front of the bullet, if you've got any real tension, you're marking the front part of the drive, or essentially the, the, through the front shoulder of your bullet, you're actually pushing down and leaving marks where the bullet is being pressed in. I don't want to see that either. 
to a point there where I have actually in the third in going through the process, which I saw no negatives to, in loading the likes of the machined monolithic bullets and getting them to go as smoothly as possible, where I would run a tiny piece of lube around the top of the actual neck to actually load it. I don't do that anymore. I didn't see any negatives, but when I got my tensions just right, it'll go in smoothly. They don't get to a point where you've got to break them, the, the traction to get them to go in. They'll smoothly go in. And you may consider that that's going to cause an issue. They'll shake, they'll move out. No, they actually they go in smoothly. You stop them. They actually set there in a form, so they don't want to move. They are still stuck. They're still there with, with enough tension to hold the bullet in a firm place. <clears throat> but the main thing I'm getting out of that is that they're very, very, very consistent. One of the things that we do do occasionally, we've got the equipment for, we do do it occasionally when we need to, but only when we need to, um, is actually neck turning. So when we're actually taking the material on these, on the actual neck down to make them consistent. And um, we have done it, we do do it on occasions, um, only when we need to. Um, we started to do it when we first started to re-go back into the, um, the 375 shytech or the 375 Gibbs in our case. This is just the starting, um, the, the parent, or the, the, the 375 Shytac case, which I've got here for an example. But in some of the brass we had to go through, we were finding inconsistencies and trying to make that make sense for us, and we did. As a rule, I try not to. I try and use good brass and that is consistent, and the the other feature that I go through of my with my um, neck sizing, be it in a full length sizer or in just the neck sizer, is I try and set up to where I'm actually using the ball, the expanding ball, in a standard set of dies, I try and use that as my final finish of my neck size. Now there is situations where I do not use that. My shy tag is one of them, or the, the Gibbs is one of them, where I actually don't use the ball. I actually use just the neck sizer, um, and the right next exercise to go with that with that brass to be able to get the right tension and I do do that as a rule I want to try and set up to where I'm able to do it with just an average good quality um, neck sizing tool or full sizing tool that uses the extend expandable is the last thing to run through that brass um, I try and use it if I can end up in that place can't always but if I can then the last thing to go through there the, the way they work the ball goes down through there then the actual neck sizing bush goes across and squash it to the right place and then that comes off and the ball comes back through so the last actual size for people who aren't aware if you're, if you're changing your your running a, an adjustable neck sizing bush on top in there and you set that to a different place but you're still run, running the ball, well the ball's actually got control on what that size is. Um, I prefer to use that. If I can, if I can set it up where that works, I prefer to use it because it's the last piece to come through here. So um, as I mentioned, that means that the last thing to run through this actually smooths out the inside of that, any little bags, anything inside there, that's the last thing to come through, which essentially, in my mind at least, is giving a smoother track for the bullet. It's the the last bit I'm putting your, your round together is that bullet is going to go in there. If the last bit of metal preparation meant we slid that ball backwards and forwards through there, then we know it's super smooth. If we've got it set up with the right tensions, then it's going to go in there very nicely. So that's that's how I like to do it if I can. Like I said, there are exceptions, there are things where that changes around very much your load, your brass, your rifle, your setup but that's how I try and have it. Another feature that I do, and we'll come back up to this, these drawings up here, and essentially looking at the, the case side of it, and if we have our case drawer and we have the, the firing hole and the primer pocket, one of the, what we consider they look like is essentially this drawing down here. Firing hole, primer pocket. All nice and straight and consistent as it should be. Well, in actual fact, if you look at these three drawings here, you'll see what we actually can be looking like. Where essentially we have um, from in this point where the way, and it's about the way the case, and some cases aren't so bad, and some cases are very good, and some cases are very bad. But essentially the way it's formed, and in this case, and I've seen cases like this where the, the actual punch of the, um, of the firing hole 
goes through and leaves little bags essentially on the inside of the chamber. Um, and it can even, if to be truthful, if they're all exactly the same, that's not going to change anything. Um, over in these, where essentially they're not quite so tall, they're not quite so protruded, and on this side of things, this drawing is demonstrating that essentially they're uneven. It's irregular as it's going. What I'm chasing essentially is it to be uniform and be consistent. What I use to do that is another Sinclair tool, is a primer pocket unifying tool. It has uh, essentially a little cutter that's inside here and then an adjustable sleeve that you can then set how much chamfer you want to put inside there. Now, potentially putting that chamfer in there could have some negatives. You're putting a place where the force potentially could spread out and open the, the primer pocket, which is one of the things you will have with when you're pushing case uh, in higher pressures, you can have your primer pocket opening out. I haven't really seen that as a problem caused by that side of things, but it's a potential. Up here at the diagram, you'll show where that tool actually goes in. It goes in, sits down, and machines out to where we end up with this. Now, I'm going to a point the way I do my cases is to make sure that I've got rid of all of these chamfers, all of these, or not these chamfers, all of this protruding material, make sure that's all gone. Um, the other, there's, and I don't know the science, I don't know where it would come to, there's a case of where you're actually letting that get out and get to more places with its burn. I don't really feel that's an issue, um, but, and I, like I said, I don't really, haven't really got any research to say anything there, but I have got research to say both when this actual cutter goes through and makes sure this is dead round, I'm not talking about enlarging the side of the primer hole, these are designed to go with the standard size firing hole I should say, I'm not talking about enlarging that at all. Um, the, the setting of the chamfer is your choice, um, I've set it at a point I want. And the other side of things is you'll, you'll notice on this tool, I actually use it in a, in a small hand drill, but this chamfer pace up here means that you can set it up in your brass to where it lines up, this isn't set up for this case, but essentially to where it actually holds this dead steel on the top. So you end up with a dead straight, that little cutter goes through the core, it can cut that chamfer and you end up with it dead straight. So they are all completely consistent and, and as it says, unifying the, fire, the firing pocket. Um, so to sum up what in, in my way of loading, essentially your consistency in your powder charge is the only relevant thing I have to a powder charge. I don't do a ladder test, I don't try and I don't do an extreme spread, I don't really use a chronograph. I will sometimes to find out the actual speed but largely I'll use programs to figure out what my speed is. What I want is small groups at long ranges and I'll make sure that that's how they're performing. Um, but part of that is a very consistent powder charge. As for its number, I don't really care. I work that out by pressure. As mentioned, with looking at my high pressure side of things is where I actually work out where that should be. The putting the bullet in straight, uh, something I didn't mention, using good brass, probably one of the most important details. In the old days, I went through the process of, and had the logic of, listen, any brass, if you do all the right things, you'll make it shoot. Um, and yes to a degree, but in the big picture, no, I've never found it. In the big picture, it's one of the things that can take a lot of frustration out by using good brass. Um, might not be for everyone, and, and I should say what that means, I use Lapua most of the time um, is what I use for wherever I can get it, I'll use Lapua. I'm not saying it's the best, I'm saying it's what I use. Um, and I use Norma. Basically Lapua don't do the belted magnums that I've ever managed to find it and I've used Norma and found Norma is reliable. We have tried a few different pieces, of, a few different styles of brass. There may be other ones. This is what I found I can get and works really well for me. I'm really happy with. Good brass, very consistent powder charges. I suppose on the powder side of things, I use the ADI powders, um, different names in America to, to Australia, but super consistent. I haven't found anything that is as reliable and consistent. But in all fairness, I really haven't tried that much else. I have used a little bit, never found it as good. I've gone back to my ADI, it works brilliantly, it's what I use. The, the rest of it is pretty straightforward. The loading, I, I, like I said, I sometimes do a lot of cleaning, I sometimes don't. Doesn't make a lot of difference in my opinion. I 
when I do clean, I clean thoroughly. I will use a detergent. I use the likes of the, the Sonic, um, the Hornady shot. I've used several of them. It doesn't really seem to make much difference. Um, I use a warm water in a stainless steel tumbler. And I find that actually does a nice job of cleaning the brass up. And I wouldn't be surprised by the way it behaves. It doesn't do a little bit of stress relieving by the constant little rubbing and, and uh, the effort that it goes through on that side of things. But neither of these are done that way. I should say I've got the two. I've got the little tiny 17 Hornet out there and 375 Shytac. Basically to say that um, there's no difference. Whether it's the little tiny ones or the big ones, um, the, the basic core of what we do is no difference. The only difference I'd say and that is round by round is whether it's full length sized or neck sized or a combination of the two comes down to what's to suit, suit the rifle. Suits what I'm doing and what I've found and the only way I've found to get there and make that decision is by trial and error. It's by using it, see where it goes, see where it works and, and, and basically making sense of what suits you. The, the tips that I would say are super, super important in my opinion, this tool the VLD of whatever brand it is, but essentially making that chamfer super nice inside there um, and primer pocket unifying, I found that does make a difference. It has improved things when I started to use that and use that properly. So the last bit I'd say, which is back to my, and, and one of the details as to how I get my very consistent um, neck pressure, the actual seating pressure or the, the, the actual neck tension, um, is I will do, and it confused people a little bit last time, I'll go through the normal process. Where it's, whether it's neck sizing or full length sizing, I will do that as the first point of looking at my brass. I then will go through and clean it in whatever form, whether it's minimal or it's maximum, I'll go through and clean it. The next things then come, if it's trimming, then we do the trimming. If it's not trimming, we're just doing the, the um, chamfering, but we end up with a chamfered piece of brass that is ready to go. I don't leave it in that form. I will tend to, not always, but tend to run it back through the neck sizer. Now the reason I'm doing that is that essentially I, that, that comment of wanting that bullet to be perfect is why I'm doing it. You've already done your full length sizing. You're not going to change the size of your chamber, change the length of your case by running a neck sizer over it. But what you are going to do is if your chamfering and all the finishing and all the stuff you've done on there has left any little bags and metal doesn't always cut clean. If you've left any of those, then running your neck sizer across again will essentially make sure that that is smooth and flat and as nice as it can be. So that's what I tend to do in trying to make the most accurate load. I will run that neck sizer again. Now I will also make sure, if, and it depends on the brass and how it works, but I will use a tiny piece of lube on it that close. And most people will tell you you can't you want to keep it all super dry and keep all your um, impurities out of your loading and that side of things. The, the truth of it is what I tend to do and this is a feature that is more my mechanical way of doing things, I'll tend to finish with slightly oil brass. When I say slightly I mean very very slightly. I mean the mist of oil has gone there and I'll tend to use a not a wet rag but, a, but I'll tend to finish things off, wipe them off to make sure they're clean but there is an oil residue on them. Now you don't want much oil on them at all, you can cause yourself issues, you can change your head spacing, you can basically cause issues with your chambering of the bullet, that sort of things if you've got a wet bullet. But if you've got a very, very slightly oiled bullet, two, two factors um, are what I do it for. I, I don't like, like I said, I'm a mechanic, I'm an uh, automotive engineer, I've worked in with steel and metal all my life. Dry metal is bad to me. I don't want to see dry metal. I'll go through that with, with the, the cleaning video and the way of the rifle, but I don't like dry metal. The, the reason I don't like dry metal is dry metal rubbing against dry metal means worn metal. Something's wearing in that process. Um, the other reason is dry metal is metal exposed to water, exposed to moisture. So you've got corrosion. So to have a very slight mist over that bullet, see I see no negatives, absolutely no negatives and that's including if you have a tiny bit in that neck I don't have an issue with it. I'm talking a tiny bit. I don't want oil, CRC or blistol or any grease dripping into the powder but if there's a tiny bit of the inside of that neck I have no issues with it. 
So to go through and actually do, as I mentioned, a final neck size is the last thing I do before I put the primer in and then get it all ready. There is no negatives in the way of what I've found with shooting. It's something that, that not always, but 90% of the time, I will actually do that. really depends on the brass and how the bullets load and that side of things and whether they're being shot tomorrow or they're being put back in the cupboard. But essentially, there is, that, that is one of the features I like to do. Those are the keys that I go through to make bullets shoot well. Quite different, and I'll stress that, this is quite different to what um, I've ever heard people do. This is out of my way of doing it, of what I've been doing, um, and the simple logics I have are essentially that a bullet and a barrel are going to stri uh, fly straight together. I want the amount of pressure to be behind them to be extremely consistent, and and I want the, them to be not hurting themselves, so essentially the cases and the, and the gun, I don't want to be damaging, so I don't want too much pressure on that side of things. And I suppose that's the last bit I'll touch on there, is that the, a little bit more speed out of a bullet by trying something extra special to get it to go a little bit faster. In ELR shooting, eh, it's not really relevant. You essentially Yes, you might be able to get, in, in, in long range shooting, you might be able to get it a little bit faster, so you're dealing with a little bit west, less wind and a little bit more distance in supersonic flight, so it's a little bit better, a little bit better. Um, to me, I want super consistency and we're in subsonic flight most of the time, so whether we gain ourselves another 100 yards or not isn't that much of an issue. You know, it's a little bit more holdover, you know, so it's, um, it's a little bit more adjustment on the scope. It's not a big deal. So consistency is the key to me good products is the next key um, and then make the gun shoot anyway the next one will be which i'll do the next video will actually be about gun cleaning um, a little bit involved with this with that we'll do the the break-in side of things because the two things are really handy in hand uh, but um thanks for checking us out and we'll um we'll see you in the next one